Thank you. 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 Thank you.
uh, the shape of these compact extra dimensions in um, a string compactification, and particularly the metric, and possibly on gauge connections in the extra dimensions. So for example, in heterotic string theory, which I'll use as an example in several aspects of this talk, um, there are gauge field BEVs over uh, a six dimensional compact space and um, assorted quantities that you want to know in the low energy theory, for example, in the heterotic context, the n equals one um, superpotential Yukawa couplings descend from a 10 dimensional term in the action that takes this form um, for the gauge fields that exist in the, the E8 cross E8 theory in 10D. And normalization of fields and coefficients in the superpotential will manifestly depend on the metric over the compact space. Um, if you define a perturbative theory around a background, so you choose gauge field VEVs over your compact um, uh, six dimensional manifold and then perturb, these perturbations appear as matter fields in your 4D theory. So the expansion um, effectively says choose a gauge bundle over your compact space and then fluctuate that connection. Uh, the space time dependent fluctuations are going to be the matter fields, and these are expanded in a basis of harmonic one forms over your 6D compact space which are counted by some vector bundle cohomologies, for example. Um, things like superpotential trilinear couplings are then given as an integral of some harmonic forms over a compact manifold. Why am I highlighting this? Because um, in general, things that you would really like to know about the n equals one theory in this example, things like the matter field Kähler potential and the normalization of couplings like this manifestly depend on the metric. So just to say that a little bit more explicitly, um, in say the heterotic context, we're interested in particle masses and couplings, and there's a rich array of pheno questions that you might have for these. Um, we understand, of course, that in um, the standard model, we see a lot of rich textures and hierarchies, the top quark being considerably heavier than everything else, for example. Um, if we are considering supersymmetric theories as we, you know, MSSM type geometries as we, we are here, um, there's of course the famous mu problem um, you want to, analyze the structure of the effective theory to understand if you are facilitating rapid proton decay, etc. So there's a bunch of questions you want to ask, and the question is, do you have the technical control to answer those questions? Um, as I mentioned before, a major obstacle in determining that 4D potential is that the matter field Kähler potential is effectively unknown. So um, schematically, this takes this form, and the, the real problematic part is there are these bundle-valued harmonic forms, and there's a um, gauged uh, Hodge star that appears in this formula, again, metric dependent. So what I wanna focus on today is the easiest class of solutions for a string compactification, namely uh, choosing the compact extra dimensions to be a complex scalar manifold and um, potentially with a Ricci flat metric, i.e. a Calabiao background. And this is the not the only by any means um, class of solutions, but the easiest class of string solutions for, for many dimensional reductions. So um, the question is, in this context, how do we determine the metric and connection? Um, in terms of complete generality, there's been some, some very nice work um, by uh, Shamat Katru and, and collaborators on K3 surfaces trying to come up with interesting ways of, of determining metrics. But in general, for Calabiao threefolds and higher, um, the only current uh, sort of viable approach is through numeric approximation. And this is something that I worked on um, with collaborators many years ago, about 10 years ago and then just recently came back to this year. So I wanna outline for you, what are the existing numeric techniques before this year? And then what have um, approaches with machine learning brought to the table in terms of um, improving the technical power of this, this approximation? So the basic idea, I apologize, this is a little, little mathy, um, this, this slide, but um, the idea, how are you going to approximate a metric? Well, um, you need some control over a simple class of metrics that you can write down very explicitly that you can sort of specify everything you're interested in and be able to have confidence that you can tweak parameters until you can get closer and closer to the Ricci flat one. So what natural class of metrics do you have at your disposal? Um, the answer for this is uh, that most of the explicit Calabiao solutions that we write down can be naturally embedded into larger projective spaces. So complex projective spaces are extremely simple. Uh, and this happens through something called the Kodaira embedding. Um, the idea is given any uh, line bundle or abelian, abelian gauge field on the Calabiao, then there exists an embedding of that manifold into some high dimensional complex projective space that happens through the global sections of that line bundle. Um, you need enough global sections to parameterize what's going on. Uh, so in principle, you have to take an ample line bundle and twist it to a high power to have a large number of global sections. 
Um, but once you do that, then on this large complex projective space, there's a very simple known metric. Um, this is not a Ricci flat metric. This is um, you know, manifold of positive curvature, the so-called Fubini studi metric. Um, it is Kähler, and it has the simple form that it's the natural log of effectively mod z squared, but normalized um, with some Hermitian non-singular matrix Hij bar. So if you should take this metric, you can then restrict back to x, um, and what you'll get is not Ricci flat. But um, you can, uh, there's a, a powerful theorem which tells you that you can actually toggle the parameters in this approximation to get closer and closer to a Ricci flat solution. So in particular, um, it is known that Kähler potentials of the form that I'm writing here are actually dense in the moduli space of all Kähler potentials. So these are going to be a viable approximation scheme um, everywhere that you wiggle in possible metric moduli space. And um, there's a powerful theorem by Nolanson, which employs the notion of a so-called balanced metric, which is um, that if you have a particular form of this Hermitian matrix on the space of sections of some line bundle and under integration of a T operator, the details of this are not essential for my talk, but um, there's an iterative procedure in order to refine this Hermitian matrix H, then you can argue um, very non-trivially that there is a limit um, for very large K such that metrics of this type will converge to the unique Ricci flat metric for the given Kähler class um, and complex structure. So Donaldson's um, theoretical work guaranteed that there was a limiting scheme that can get you eventually um, uh, for sufficiently large amounts of work to a uh, Ricci flat metric. Now, of course, um, in principle, this could be you know, a K equals infinity limit to, to actually reach Ricci flatness. Numerically, you're not going to reach a perfect approximation, but you could try and implement this and tune yourself closer and closer to a Ricci flat solution. So um, they, uh, let me actually back this up one, one slide here, sorry. I realized there was one more thing I wanted to say. Um, in my collaborators and I uh, order um, 10 years ago actually uh, implemented numeric uh, approximations of this type. So we actually implemented the Donaldson algorithm um, numerically and we could run this on you know, supercomputer clusters and you could produce a Calabia metric uh, on order of a few months. You could get a Calabia metric approximated to reasonable accuracy at sort of one point in its complex structure in Kähler moduli space. The downside of this is that um, you can ask, is this actually good enough for the purposes that you want to use for, for um, string compactifications as I outlined on my first slide? And the answer is nobody really knows because there were just so many steps in order to compute the metric, then actually compute you know, harmonic forms, normalized fields. No one had actually pushed this um, further, but it's fair to say that the, the sheer length and computational intensity of a metric at one point in moduli space was a major obstacle. So my collaborators and I did this about 10 years ago, and then, sure. So instead of taking the Fubini study metric on the higher dimensional space, uh, wouldn't it be better to consider some Ricci flat metric on the higher dimensional space and then consider what you're doing? Great question. So um, on the, the projective space that you're using to parameterize things, there is no Ricci flat metric. So you can show by the topology of that space that it has positive curvature. So um, there's no way to, to write down Ricci flat metric on that space. You can pull it back to the Calabiao using this approximation scheme. And there you know that a Ricci flat metric should exist thanks to Yao's theorem. But um, it's just, you're okay. getting a handle on it through imperfect information. Okay. But very good question. Okay, so um, numeric implementations of this algorithm due to Donaldson um, were done, as I said, about 10 years ago by um, Mike Douglas and collaborators, Bert Overit and collaborators, including myself, um, and it's computationally intensive. The moduli dependence in particular was something that we didn't have a handle on. So the algorithm, as I outlined it, you have to specify a single point in complex structure in the moduli space, do this whole computation, um, and then you get an approximate metric. So um, the, the sort of summary of the rest of the talk, um, what we did in this last year was to try and use techniques from machine learning to um, speed up this process, to make this more efficient, and also to try and get a handle on the moduli dependence of the metric. So what we did in particular were um, several experiments in machine learning, um, including the supervised learning of moduli dependence of Calabia metrics using the Donaldson algorithm to generate training data and then direct learning of moduli-dependent Calabia metrics using both a metric ansatz and without it, 
And then the thing that I personally think is the most interesting is that we were able to actually extend this away from the simple case of complex Kähler geometries into so-called SU3 structure manifolds, um, which are complex, but not Kähler. Um, these are solutions with torsion, which are more general solutions of, of string backgrounds, um, but harder to um, describe using the techniques of algebraic geometry. So I wanna give a brief flavor of these results. I should mention that um, the work that came out in December of last year with my collaborators and I, um, we learned of, of uh, similar work being done by Mike Douglas and collaborators and actually coordinated release of our papers together. And also Vishnu Jajala um, had a paper very shortly after ours that touched on similar themes. Um, so this, I wanna flag these works as being also very nice and similar in spirit. Um, also more recently, these gentlemen, um, including uh, Fabian who worked on the project I'm discussing with me, um, have actually released some of this code as a package that people can play with and apply to, um, to scenarios of interest themselves. Okay, so let me begin by just saying, how uh, are we going to implement these techniques that I described in the context of machine learning? So um, for those of you that are not familiar with Calabiao geometry, let's try and sort of strip out the, the barest bones um, description of what a Calabiao is. Uh, one definition of a Calabiao threefold is that it is some complex three-dimensional manifold, which admits a nowhere vanishing real two form and a complex three form, J and omega respectively, that obey certain differential and multiplicative properties. The differential properties in the case of Calabiao, both um, the uh, Kähler form in this case and um, the complex uh, three form, holomorphic three form, have to be closed in the Calabiao case, and they obey certain orthogonality relationships with one another. And the top forms that you can uh, create via these objects are proportional. So this is a three three form over a complex manifold on both sides, they have to be the same. So there's a unique top form on a Calabiao. Um, for Kähler manifolds, this metric is related to the two form in a usual way. The metric is um, I times the, the metric is the coefficients of the Kähler form. And of course, uh, examples of topological Calabiao manifolds are algebraically very easy to write down, things like the famous Quintic threefold in complex um, four dimensional projective space, the degree five polynomial, the zero locus of that, for example, the so called Fermat Quintic, is an example of a Calabiao. It'll be important for what I'm about to talk about that. Explicitly, one of these forms, the complex three form omega, can actually be explicitly constructed algebraically if you have a nice algebraic description of your manifold, like in the case of the quintic. And this was pointed out by Ken Dallas et al. many years ago. So um, here are the several um, experiments that we tried to do. The first is that um, you have this approximation scheme that I just described due to Donaldson, which um, says that you can iterate this T operator, you can progress to write down better and better approximations of a metric. The question that we asked here was the balanced metric output by Donaldson algorithms at a finite K, um, so a finite iteration, is not necessarily the most approximate, uh, most accurate approximation to a Ricci flat metric. Perhaps we can do better. So can we generate networks to find parameters that are trained directly to a loss function, such as this one? So I'm considering a manifold that has a J and an omega background. This condition is the one that I just um, imposed. Um, the, the matching of the top forms is something that I, I discussed as intrinsic to Calabiao's. And you can define a loss function, which essentially a neural network is just designed to minimize. Um, and I've subscripted this loss function MA from Molge Ampere. Um, this condition is going to say, find me a J and an omega. If I fix the omega for a particular algebraic description, this is find me a Kähler form J, such that this goes to zero. Um, I should mention that this approach was also used in the literature some time ago with energy minimization approaches to finding Calabia metrics by Hedrick and Massar. Um, although in their case, they were using minimization functions built into Mathematica to attack this. Um, in our case, we're going to use a neural network to ask the same question. So brief bit of details on the network architecture, standard feed forward neural network, uh, various details on number of nodes and activation functions. Um, but the punchline, not uh, getting into the details of, of machine learning, is that um, we were able to produce networks which can give a very accurate approximation to Calabiao, doing um, better than the Donaldson algorithm for a fixed iteration uh, of this approximation scheme. So here I'm showing two plots. Um, this dotted line is the Donaldson algorithm at k equals six. This is a particular iteration of your approximation using a particular um, projective space and then pulling back the metric. And here is what the neural network produces. The white region here is where we actually um, you know, computed this data. And then there is extrapolation into the gray region. 
And what you can see is that um, for a wide range of values of the complex structure, we're able to do considerably better than the Donaldson algorithm. And this extends um, and can be extrapolated nicely out to much higher values of complex structure. So we're actually writing down a moduli dependent um, metric using the neural network. Uh, the same data is shown for a wider range of complex structure on the right. So the important points, um, if you were to try and use existing numeric techniques, those that had existed about 10 years ago when my collaborators and I worked on them, the Donaldson algorithm with k equals 12 takes order days or weeks to run, um, even on the single case of one complex structure. I should say, by the way, the psi, this is just an explicit um, parameter in the defining equation for a Fermat quintic that I had on a previous slide. So um, our network at k equals six takes only minutes to run and gives comparable accuracy for a very wide range of complex structure. Um, we can do better than Donaldson at k equals six and this improvement extends quite high um, into the complex structure regime. For higher complex structure, we, we get less accuracy for all methods, including Donaldson. So- Another um, quick question. Mm -hmm. So when you're minimizing this particular uh, function to zero, that one plus uh, mm -hmm. j by omega, Omega, yep. uh, how, how is that compatible with the equations of motion for the Calabi-Yau? Good. So the equations of motion for the Calabi-Yau are effectively these four. So um, you have to satisfy the orthogonality of this j and omega. This is the one that I'm actually using as a loss function, and then you have these two. So for the, the Donaldson algorithm, by construction, because I'm using a Kähler metric on a bigger space and then restricting it, these two are actually automatically satisfied. Um, this one also you can check is satisfied for the types of omega. So effectively the only criteria for calabi outness in this setup because of the way we've built the ansatz is the mange pair loss that I'm using. Um, once we generalize away from this particular ansatz, so using these particular metrics as an approximation scheme, then your question becomes um, much broader in terms of how do I control the full uh, you know, calabi outness or SU3 structuralness of the solution. So I'll return to this point in just a second. Another thing is uh, this this equation seems to be j cube minus omega wedge omega equal to zero, but you are minimizing one plus something. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, no. when you take things over to the other side and I get switched from uh, numerator to denominator, you're dividing by the I would have been on that previous equation down here and you brought it up. So yeah, you get a sign. Okay. But yes, it is just effectively take the difference of the two. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so punchline of the previous uh, uh, comments, you can use uh, machine learning or a neural network to basically upgrade the Donaldson algorithm to make it faster and have better control of the moduli dependence, which is great, but also um, you're very much tied to the particular form of this ansatz. So another question that we asked is perhaps instead of using the Donaldson algorithm, perhaps we could just try and directly train a neural network to learn uh, a Kähler potential for the calabi metric um, directly, or not even going through the Kähler potential necessarily, just direct learning of the metric. Now you might ask why do this when you have a good ansatz at hand, why, why tinker with that? Um, the questions we wanted to ask were perhaps we could improve performance by not being tied to that ansatz. And the real reason, which is highlighted here, is that we hope to be able to generalize this approach to more complicated geometries. Um, the disadvantage, and this is very much related to the question that was just asked, is that um, you then have to say, how do you control the full calabi or um, in general, the solving the equations of motion of your solution? So if you drop the Donaldson ansatz, what you find is that you need more loss functions to minimize. Um, in particular, you have to, if you're no longer building the metric to be Kähler by construction, you have to impose Kählerity, which is this dj goes to zero. And um, because you're not using global sections of line bundles as sort of your parameters to build the metric, there's global topology that is being omitted from your approximation scheme. And so you actually have to build agreement with the transition functions patch by patch in your manifold into your algorithm. So you have what we refer to as an overlap condition, which basically says that your approximation to the metric on each patch is going to glue correctly over all overlaps. Um, you can build a composite loss function then, which includes the Monchamp pair loss, a calarity condition, and an overlap condition. Um, you can ask how you're going to weight these three different things, and we tried different um, schemes. What we found is that these weights do not actually matter um, that much. 
So um, the structure here, um, the input uh, in this case, we are taking for the neural network as the real and imaginary parts um, of the homogeneous coordinates describing a point in the Calabial, as well as um, a point in the complex structure for this Fermat quintic. And the output is actually now the D squared real and imaginary parts of a metric at a point. Um, so to give a concrete example, we optimized for complex structure psi equals 10 on a data set um, consisting of 10,000 points. Um, we split the points according to train and test for the neural network 9010, and we iterated the algorithm for 20 epochs. Um, what we find is, is shown in these plots down below. Um, basically, once again, even just dropping the onsets entirely and using a neural network to approximate the metric, we find that we can reach comparable accuracy with Donaldson um, at the level k equals five. Um, and uh, various, um, this was not sort of the most sophisticated network design ever. We just tried this as a proof of principle. Um, and my collaborators, Fabian and Sven, have already upgraded um, some of these in their, their recent package. Um, good. So what am I showing in these various plots? We can now play games with how the solution depends on the various aspects of minimization that I just outlined. So the various aspects, mange and pair, calarity, and overlap conditions. So um, the first is uh, optimizing the neural network with all three losses. And here is the approximation dropping uh, of the loss function for all three. You can optimize without the Kähler loss uh, in the middle and then uh, optimize without the overlap loss. The point between these two is you can see that um, the Kählerity condition is quite important in that the, the overall loss is, you know, uh, something weird is happening here. If you drop the calarity condition, you're not getting a good solution. But the overlap uh, loss is actually e effectively um, very minor um, compared to the others. So you still get a solution that converges very rapidly, even without imposing uh, the overlaps, which is effectively to say that overlap conditions are like a higher co-dimensional structure in the metric that is somehow, um, the solution is not that sensitive to that data. Okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, five more minutes. Five more minutes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. In, in case anybody is worried about my many more slides, I had some extra stuff, but I'll I will finish in five. So won't won't do all the my remainder of my stuff. <laughs> That's fine. So um, let me uh, just comment now on the part that I'm personally the most excited about. Um, which is learning um, of SU3 structures. So the reason that this I think is very exciting is this is a class of solutions. Um, in this case, we were going to be studying um, solutions to heterotic string theory, but you could do this for uh, any n equals two type 2a type 2b solutions as well. Um, and here, the reason this is nice is that we can obtain metrics for which there are no existence theorems known in principle. So Yao's theorem tells you that a Ricci flat metric exists on a Calabia manifold, even if you can't find it, at least you have a robust confidence that it's there. Um, for these more general SU3 structure solutions, you don't necessarily know if they're there. And so being able to find solutions, if you can convince yourself that they are um, believable using uh, numeric uh, approximations, is really a new way to find solutions um, with fundamentally different properties for string compact locations. So um, the basic idea is already highlighted here. Um, the fact that we can turn various um, effects on and off in our direct learning of the metric means that you can try to engineer a loss function um, for a metric that isn't Kähler. You can drop the Kählerity condition and impose a necessary condition for a slightly different geometric object. So the idea here is for SU3 structure manifolds, these are more general solutions um, for n equals one compactifications of string theory. In heterotic, for example, you can prove that this is the most general solution to the Strominger system. Um, these are six manifolds, again, with a nowhere vanishing two form and three form. They obey the same algebraic properties as in the Calabiao case. These top forms have to match. There's no orthogonality condition but with different differential properties. In particular, dj and d omega are no longer zero. They can be classified by so-called torsion classes, these w's, where the w's are built out of various contractions of j and omega in the following way. So um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through the full details of this. In heterotic string theory, which is what we studied, um, you can ask what combination of torsion classes give a good solution to the theory. And there is a specific set of them. Um, this is the Hull-Strominger solution, W1 and W2 is zero, uh, and this combination of W4, 5, uh, and three. Um, note that a Calabiao is a special case of an SU3 structure in which all the torsion classes are zero. Now to prove, because you don't have existence theorems for a metric, you could just go away and write a neural network to try and optimize on a loss function that's based on these same conditions that I just outlined. Um, but uh, you need to know that you actually trust the solution. 
So um, as a simple uh, first pass of a manifold to try this out on, we knew that there were some um, examples in the literature of Calabi-Yau manifolds, which admit they're topologically Calabi-Yau, but they admit not only Ricci flat metrics, but other SU3 structure solutions as well. Um, this uh, explicit example that we took in our paper was a generalization of an analytic solution by Larfors, Lucas, and Rula, um, where effectively you're taking um, the natural um, holomorphic three forms from a Calabi-Yau and combining them with complex coefficients in a way that breaks um, the calarity of the underlying solution. So we took an explicit solution known for an SU3 structure, and we asked, can a neural network find that solution um, using a similar direct learning of the metric? Um, let me skip this and just go straight to the result. So what we find is that um, using the same losses as in the Calabi-Yau case, except um, an overlap loss, um, and instead of, I've still labeled this calarity in this plot, this is wrong. Um, instead of calarity, we impose the particular torsion classes that we had chosen. Um, and what we find is that we can uh, find a, a approximation to that solution very readily using the neural network. So this gives some indication that um, you, if you were to run this for an explicitly chosen set of torsion classes or to, to run it to find torsion classes, that you may be able to train to solutions, even ones that you did not know ahead of time. Yes, question. No, I'll ask at the end of the talk. End of talk, okay. I am almost done. So um, one minute remaining, let me just highlight what um, we can do from here. So this was a very simple first point of principle for an SU3 structure solution. I don't have time to discuss this, but um, the current work that I'm working on with um, my students and my collaborator, James Gray, is extending these techniques to um, now uh, vector bundles over these Calabi hour SU3 structure solutions. And very similar techniques can be applied to learn a connection, uh, a Yang-Mills connection or Hermitian Yang-Mills connection on um, a vector bundle. Once you have this, you could try and package this together to really talk about matter field Kähler potentials, normalization of fields, and so on. So I'm gonna skip this. Good, okay. And let me just go straight to my conclusions here. Um, what I've presented very briefly in this talk um, is I hope a, a sketch of a number of experiments. Um, when I started work on this, it was not at all clear to me that machine learning techniques would actually be an advantage uh, compared to other existing approximation schemes for calabi metrics. But what we find is both in terms of the moduli dependence of the metric and the efficiency of the algorithm, neural networks actually come out on top. And this appears to be a very viable approach to trying to generate um, approximate solutions. So um, we studied direct learning of the moduli dependent calabi metrics, both using Donaldson's onsatz and not. Um, we also extended this to direct learning of metrics associated to SU3 structures with torsion. And I didn't have a chance to talk about this today, but I'm happy to comment in case anybody's interested. We've begun work to effectively package gauge connections and metrics um, in the context of heterotic theories um, in which neural networks could also approximate those full solutions. Um, the application of machine learning techniques to this area does seem promising, and there's, there's certainly a wide range of, of questions to consider. There's actually a workshop going on this week um, called the String Data Workshop, in which people are asking about applying these techniques to a wide range of topics within string theory. But the important question from my point of view is these are simply tools, and my goal is can we push the construction of string effective theories in, for example, four dimensions closer to completion? And by that, I mean having technical control of the full effective field theory. So um, in my opinion, this is an important new tool towards that goal. And I will stop there. Thank you, Lara, uh, for the wonderful talk. Shom, Shomdato, you can ask your question and then Alok, uh, you can also ask your question, but please try to be short. Yeah, so uh, you started out with the CPN sort of manif complex manifold and then uh, you kind of pull, pulled it back to the Calabio, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, are there any richy flat complex manifolds of higher dimension that you could have started out with? Great question. Why, um, why that one? So um, you need a manifold, basically um, from, a, from a geometry point of view, CPN is as close to CN as you can get as a complex manifold, right? So a compact manifold, excuse me. So it needs some compact geometry um, and you want to be able to um, explicitly write down a metric that you have complete control over. So is there some other, you know, higher dimensional calabi -Yau? Sure, right? I mean, Ricci flat, Kaler, that's calabi -Yau, So you could use a higher dimensional calabi -Yau. The problem is you don't know any metrics on these bigger Ricci flat spaces. 
So um, the question of, of embedding your manifold in something where you have control, this is the simplest one where you have a good approximation to a class of metrics and the theoretical results that these approximation schemes are dense. So I mentioned this theorem of Tian, that sort of all possible metrics in a moduli space can be parameter parameterized in this way. That's another important reason to consider that ansatz. Um, but as I mentioned later in the talk, we drop that ansatz entirely and then just train a neural network to a particular loss function directly for the metric. So that gets away from that particular approximation scheme. Okay. Um, uh, hi, Lara, that was a great talk, thanks. Uh, I had a lot of things to ask, but I think Navamita has given me permission to ask only one question. Navamita, can I I'm please sorry, ask I three? Two, please. Two, okay, uh, all right. So, uh, so since I have two questions to ask, I just want to ask uh, the following. So do you guys have a program of uh, working out exceptional G-structure odd-dimensional manifold metrics, in particular G27 folds? It's a great question. Um, that is a really logical question. And in principle, the direct learning techniques that we could use, that we used in the SE3 structure case, they're not tied to complex manifolds at all in that case. Um, so yes, this is very generalizable in principle to spin seven, to G2. Um, the catch is that we are, these, these approximation techniques, effectively the loss functions are some integral over the manifold that you're pulling to zero. So you need enough control to actually do a numeric approximation scheme or an integration scheme. So in our case, we had like, here's a set of points on a space. We know how to sort of algebraically parameterize that space. The catch would be with these more general odd dimensional spaces is you need some explicit construction topologically of the space that gives you control of the points. So if you had, for example, like a coset space construction or you know something that they would probably be tractable, but it's a little harder than in the, the algebraic case of Calabi-Aus where you just have you know, a polynomial equation in a simple ambient space. Um, that's sort of the technical obstacle, but in principle, it's very, very applicable to these other cases. Okay, thanks. And my second question is, uh, is there a way of actually seeing or implementing quantum mirror symmetries a la Schrodinger, I mean, SYZ, for example? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I have not thought about that in general. Um, I know um, there's some recent work that various people have been looking at, um, looking at you know structure of Laplace operators in various regions and moduli space. And you could imagine you know trying to sort of set up various quantities across mirror pairs that you could see if these metrics could track. You know the, the ingredients of special Lagrangians. All of these are great questions. I have not thought properly about how you would implement that. Thank but yes, I think that's an interesting question. Jyoti, one question, please. I'm, I'm very sorry. We're just sorry. very tight schedule. Jyoti, please go ahead. Uh, very sorry. It's a very elementary question, actually. I mean, uh, so can you just uh, very briefly comment on, like, uh, you know, how do you generate the data, the training data for the this direct learning procedure? I mean, what is... Uh, Great. What is um, so... So several different different ways there. So for the supervised learning, we were actually using the Donaldson algorithm and sort of the previous numeric schemes that I mentioned to generate training data. Um, for the, uh, the, the direct learning approach, um, there we were actually taking the points explicitly and you know, building you know, solutions for half of the data that we're generating, we generate a metric, train on it, and then feed it forward to extrapolate dependence on, on complex structure. So it was sort of a direct minimization problem for certain complex structures, and then you can uh, extrapolate for others. I see. So I see, I see. Okay. I see. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So our next speaker is Nemani. Nemani, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you please share your screen?